Good afternoon, everyone. I'm talking to you from CARP, a rural agricultural and commuter focused community within the city of Ottawa. Today's presentation is about local volunteers effort to increase food security, production and to increase post harvest root and vegetable quality or distribution or marketing within our local community. Our presenter today is Dr. Barry Bruce, whose life began on a family farm. His medical training in the 1970s was at Western University. He and his wife, also a family physician, upon graduation moved to CARP and set up their family health practice in CARP. Over time, he practiced, the practice expanded and became the multifaceted CARP Medical Clinic. Barry's experience includes a six year term in the late 1980s as Chief of Staff at the Queensway Carleton Hospital, located at the western edge of Ottawa. Barry, over the years, has also been a leader in many local and provincial community health care programs and projects. In the late 1900s, Barry, along with many in the 1990s, Barry, along with many local citizens, was instrumental in and led the, conver the conversion of the CARP underground World War II national security bunker into a thriving regional tourist attraction. Most recently, Barry has devoted much energy and direction in bringing the demonstration root storage facility from idea to existence. And with this short introduction to Dr. Bruce, I'm turning the meeting over to him. Thank you, Phil. And, uh, oh, that was the Diefen bunker, by the way. It was post-World War II. So uh, more nuclear war than, uh, than conventional war. Anyway, uh, thank you folks uh, for uh, attending and hopefully participating. <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you the story about our root cellar and um, ask for your comments and suggestions and questions uh, after uh, I've also quickly reminded you about some things that you probably already know, uh, food security and climate change. Uh, and then I'm gonna ask you to chime in on what does it all mean? And I think we use, need to use our imagination here. Uh, some of the meaning relates to climate change. And you've read an article uh, about um, Dr. Peter Carter that was recently distributed. Some of you did anyway. It's uh, rather daunting. And, um, and uh, I've actually included a slide about that. Um, we're a new board at Deep Roots Food Hub um, and we're struggling with our vision. And we're interested in uh, just what does our root cellar maybe mean to the big picture, if anything. So this is a picture of our beautiful root cellar, uh, more or less as it is now. And uh, it started uh, in the, started probably around 2015. Um, I had chaired a, a group called the Rural Healthy Living Coalition along with Julie McCurcher. And we started to talk about food and we morphed into uh, a group that decided to counter what was a food desert in West Carleton. That means you can't, there's no grocery stores in West Carleton to speak of. And uh, we also decided that we needed to um, look at transportation costs for all the food we were importing to Canada and uh, our carbon dioxide emissions as well, so climate change. Um, the root cellar uh, is on uh, National Capital Commission property now, and um, the idea is that it would benefit uh, the local community as well as local growers. We started out with a funding source and uh, that was $125,000. It was a new leaf grant from the Ottawa Community Foundation. And we also later on got $48,500 from Ontario Greenbelt Fund and $25,000 from the city of Ottawa. 
So the timeline uh, uh, was that uh, once we got established uh, as a nonprofit uh, corporation, we uh, held a number of healthy food workshop series and um, we searched around for a location for a root cellar that we had pledged to build and ran afoul of many uh, city regulations. However, uh, National Capital Commission was much more friendly to a unique uh, request and uh, that's where we are now. So um, it's on the site of uh, Beatbox Cooperative Farm uh, at 230 Davidson Side Road. The, um, in December, uh, well, the end of November, actually, the root cellar kit was delivered and construction was started early in December by volunteers. Our money had run low, uh, low enough by that point that the only design that we uh, could um, conceive was a design that could be built by volunteers. Uh, and 3,000 hours later, and about $115,000 later, uh, we were able to put a first test crop and that successfully survived the uh, winter of 2019-2020. So um, this year we've done ongoing fit-ups, um, just finished testing uh, ice cube uh, and I'll explain that later. We have about uh, roughly 5,000 pounds of produce in the, prod in the produce chamber. And we have not quite successfully weathered uh, an unprecedented uh, historic warm spell in November. There's where we are, it's near Shirley's Bay. So just show you a few pictures of volunteers braving the cold because it was cold. This was uh, 14, uh, 14 degrees minus 14 degrees centigrade on the 11th of December, 2018. That's my brother standing there. He and I started to pull out 5,000 pounds of metal and start to assemble it. And, um, he and I together had about the same kind of training for this that you would expect you'd get in medical school. This is, uh, these are other shots of volunteers. We were never short of volunteers, which is amazing given the discomfort uh, that we had. I. The only, the only injury I suffered was uh, was uh, a cold injury to my fingers, so um, it lasted about two weeks. There's uh, Rob Tovel. He's our technical guy and uh, set up the uh, computer systems and subsystems in the building. And uh, that's the building more or less as it is now. So it's a galvanized steel structure. Um, it's uh, 37 by 24 by 12 feet high. And the foundation is 18 inches deep. It's uh, their footings. Underneath the footings and for five feet out, we put in uh, high density foam. So it's about our 12 and, uh, goes, and it goes underneath the footings and up inside to join the rest of our insulation. We, uh, our only power is derived from solar panels, which charge for, at the moment, for uh, truck batteries. And you can also see an air inlet port. We, brought, we bring air in. Uh, the theory is that when it gets too cold to have crops in the field, that uh, it will be also cold at night. So we pull in cold air at night to cool things down. And of course, anything that comes in has to go out. So an air outlet port as well. 
This is a picture of the storage chamber. Uh, so at the end, there's about R40 conventional insulation. Uh, partway through, um, the budget uh, would not permit putting spray foam everywhere. <laughs> so we had to put uh, conventional insulation. Uh, and that, so we became experienced with uh, N95 masks long before COVID came along. And uh, the spray foam was, uh, what you see there cost about $25,000 and it gives uh, about our 50 uh, insulation value. Uh, we put in uh, a, a false floor. Uh, the theory was that we'd be fighting the heat that would come off the floor um, and it's rock, it would have a, a, a lot of um, stored heat. And if we didn't want to fight that, we would isolate it. And in fact, we would use the heat underneath the floor. So you can see a little opening there. Um, and we would use the heat under the floor to um, uh, warm the place up when we needed to. So you can see that uh, it's, a, it's the length of cement blocks. Uh, they're eight, eight inch blocks, which means they're really seven and a half inches. We oriented it so that not only did it provide structural support for the floor, but um, also it provided a method for heat exchange. So uh, warmth from the core of the earth, as Art puts it, uh, comes up and warms our floor all through the winter and transfers to the cement blocks and uh, is slowed down a bit by our, uh, about our 12 styrofoam sheets uh, overlaid by a three quarter inch plywood floor. Uh, and you'll, I'll tell you about the ice cube and the coroplast box uh, later on. Um, that's how the bats are attached. You can also see that um, I put up uh, a chute of coroplast that's an eight inch gap behind the coroplast at the end of the wall here. And that's, that allows air to um, be pulled underneath the floor and uh, be heated up and exit the other end. I was hoping that that cold end wall, that's a north wall, would actually cause the air to drop and it would actually run itself. That did not work. So uh, we put in uh, fans. So we have two 12 volt 80 watt fans that run off the batteries to pull that air out uh, when we need it. We try to keep the temperature in the produce chamber between two and four degrees centigrade. Um, and I'll have to tell you, uh, this worked extremely well. Uh, once the temperature got a little uncomfortably cold, uh, you know, below two, heading towards one, we would turn on the heat and, um, and well, the heat is just pulling air out from the false floor. It would warm the place up within 10 minutes. Um, so our main limitation there was having enough power to uh, run those fans sufficiently. We did occasionally have to start the generator uh, to uh, run the fans. At no time did we bring in any heaters uh, or any cooling uh, bots either. Uh, only moving air. This is the antechamber. So the antechamber is uh, 12 feet in length. The produce chamber is 24 feet in length or so. And um, it's about R20. And you can see that we're lit by an LED light fixture. Um, we have electricity coming in from our solar panels and going through the uh, uh, controller 
and uh, an exhaust port to uh, remove the warm air that comes out from the storage chamber when we're bringing in cool air and uh, the storage batteries. Uh, we have, that was, we only had two at that time, not nearly enough, we have four now. So uh, Rob Tovel has expertise in computer electronics. And um, so we have installed uh, humidity and temperature sensors. And these are electronic. They hook, they hook into um, microcontrollers, which in turn uh, provide a, a Wi-Fi signal, a wireless signal to a Raspberry Pi uh, in this panel. It's a small computer. And um, the, the Raspberry Pi then communicates with a cell phone, uh, which allows us to monitor and control uh, systems inside the root cellar remotely. Um, in some cases, uh, the programming allows this to occur automatically. In other cases, uh, we need to do it manually. So it takes time to do all this programming and we're gradually uh, working our way through it. Um, and the other features of the antechamber are cold air inlet and, a, and on top of it, a warm air outlet that goes to and from the, what I call the ice cube uh, outside and we'll get into uh, that later. It has its own uh, electrical box and uh, controller, as you can see. Um, what we're looking at is from the inside of the produce chamber. I have since taped down all of that uh, insulation, so this is an older photograph, um, but the arrow is pointing to an intake fan uh, housing and that flaps up when the fan comes on and brings in external cool air into the storage chamber when the temperature threatens to go above four degrees centigrade. Um, that wall is about our 40 and uh, because it never gets uh, much below freezing up in the antechamber, that wall is probably the warmest wall of all. It's probably about R60. Um, you can also see a humidity monitor there, an LED light, and our 48 inch wide doorway. I've put um, high density foam, so about R12, covered with coroplast uh, on those doors to increase the insulation factor there since. So uh, the ice chamber. Uh, I looked over the photographs that we had and I can hardly understand them. So um, I just drew a crude diagram here. As, so this is a cube that is surrounded by straw bales and has four layers. The layers are each populated by a bunch of windshield washer Antifree, or windshield antifreeze containers, 3.78 liters each. So there's about 240 of those. So that comprises nearly a metric ton of water inside this ice cube, which is four by four by four. So when we need to uh, freeze these containers, we bring air from the outside. It's uh, brought in by this fan it goes through the, fro uh, through the uh, water containers and gradually cools them down and uh, that warmer air is exhausted again to the outside air. Uh, once we get those frozen, and we did get them frozen already, allowing us to test it, um, and uh, we, we can switch to another mode. So this, um, this is closed here and these are open so that air, warmish air from the produce chamber is brought in 
It's passed through uh, about 16 feet of frozen containers and goes back into the produce chamber. And we've recently tested this and I think it um, performed beautifully. Uh, we need to put it through some more tests, but uh, I'm quite, I was quite impressed with how it tested. So this is how it looks or how it looked as we were putting things together. This is really the bottom of this coroplast cube and uh, it allows condensation to go down and seep into the ground. Um, there's a, a layer of straw bales, plywood, and um, uh, that's about it for that. So here you can see the air coming in. This is a fan coming into the top layer, going through these bottles and um, this is a picture of the, uh, again, the inside uh, pushing the air in. Um, as you can, I'll just go back to the, you'll notice that there's a gap at the back of this support layer pushing the air through all right, and that's, this is an older photograph. It looks a little bit better now, but uh, it still is not particularly elegant. Um, what you see at the top here is a, a ridge, a ridge pole essentially, but it's, uh, it's sewage pipe, it's hollow. There's a bunch of holes in the center of it. And uh, that prevents uh, pressure from building up inside and blowing our cover off and it works, that works really well. It also keeps the straw, uh, keeps any condensation from building up inside and uh, keeps heat from building up inside too. I think it works really well. So the, um, this is more or less what the produce chamber looks like now. We're probably at about 10% capacity and uh, we're just getting uh, we're not particularly well organized. What I'm s pointing out here with my pointer is uh, a series of boxes that are made out of uh, leftover coroplast. Um, and those will hold between 18 and 24 kilograms of produce in uh, a very I think a very efficient use of space. So one layer is able to hold 16 of those uh, boxes, which we're making as we, as we speak. Uh, someone else, and uh, my pointer is circling around that, has stored her, uh, her CSA boxes here. These are boxes that, uh, these are storage boxes from which uh, boxes will go out to her customers every one to two weeks. And uh, she's trusted, she has trusted us to keep them cool for her. This produce is from Exafarm, which is another uh, project that I run that just, uh, allows people to get physical exercise and, uh, and produce food on a small farm. Um, challenged by attendance, challenged by COVID, but we still managed to uh, produce uh, between two and three tons of food. And uh, thanks to Phil, uh, we have a storage shed for gasoline and generator. It's illegal to have those enclosed in a space. Um, and this is also, thanks to Phil, uh, we got a donation of a 20 foot storage container, removes a lot of the clutter from the antechamber uh, and we pull building materials out of this and uh, other things. Uh, this is, uh, well, it's sort of a part of what our uh, telemetry looks like on a computer. And um, 
we can monitor temperature and humidity in the various chambers as well as the uh, charge on our batteries. And what we did last, uh, last November, about November the 3rd, uh, we, uh, well, I declared the place operational and um, even though it was barely so, and we started to record data on November the 21st and this is five degrees centigrade. And as you can see, um, almost until the 15th of May, we managed to stay below five degrees centigrade and, and never freeze our produce. Um, we, I pulled uh, rutabagas out uh, 15th of May that were still edible, but they were starting to get a tiny bit soft and a tiny bit sprouty looking. Um, this is the ice cube testing. And this was, uh, we were um, lucky to have a period that got very cold and we could freeze our containers by spreading them out individually on the parking lot and then uh, put them in side. And um, this was in readiness for uh, a, a warm spell that we knew we were getting. And um, so, I'll, so what we had was 13 degrees at 5.30 in the evening on November the 20th. Um, 13 degrees outside centigrade, and um, we turned, that was when I turned the ice cube on. And you can see that uh, the outflow temperature dipped. Uh, actually, no, the outflow temperature came up. Um, and but the outflow temperature was about uh, one degree. The inflow temperature was um, about five and a half degrees. So um, once we turn the ice cube on uh, over the next few hours, and I had to run the generator to provide enough power to the fans to do this, the temperature dropped to about four degrees centigrade uh, purely from the ice cube and it was fighting outside temperatures that were well above zero or well above uh, 10 even uh, degrees centigrade. Okay, so um, current challenges. We have minimal control over humidity. Uh, we don't have quite enough power. We do have to run in and start the generator from time to time. Uh, we, have, we had trouble with the season start. Season was cold and then it became very warm and a historic uh, over a week long warm spell with no cold temperatures at night. And the temperature did get up to about nine degrees uh, centigrade in there. That's about normal root cellar temperature, uh, you know, the kind you dig into a hill. But, um, uh, and we of course can't operate during the summertime. Um, we're still working on methods to store our produce. We're working on a business and marketing plan together with Sprott Business School. Um, and uh, we have a grant to do that and an intern who's working on that and just started uh, two or three weeks ago with uh, helping us out. And uh, we have not much money to speak of, but that's okay. Um, we've essentially got uh, a, a root cellar that's built. So um, before I go on to the next, uh, just a next quick section which is going to remind you uh, about maybe 
why we're why we're here. I'll give you some some ideas about what maybe this means. Um, maybe you can start writing your questions uh, into chat, uh, questions and comments and suggestions. So uh, we're gonna I'm gonna ask you. So what? Uh, what does it mean? What would it look like if we scaled all this up? Uh, what could it mean to the bigger picture if it was scaled up? And if not a root cellar, uh, what? So um, while you're contemplating those, I'll just uh, remind you that household food insecurity uh, is a problem in Canada. And um, it's getting worse. So you can see that between 2007 and 2017, we added another million people in Ontario who were, or in Canada, sorry, who were food insecure. And um, food insecurity, household food insecurity is um, inadequate or insecure access to food due to financial constraints. And uh, it's a serious problem in Canada that uh, negatively impacts physical, mental, and social health and costs our healthcare system considerably. Um, so average healthcare costs by food insecurity status. So um, it goes up the more food uh, insecure you are. And this is for just Ontario alone a $60 billion budget, and you've got uh, over 4 million people who are contributing to that budget. So millions of people costing the healthcare system thousands of uh, dollars, perhaps unnecessarily, um, you know, to the extent that there's a cause and effect relationship between food insecurity and health. This is an infographic from uh, ISIS, which is the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. So it's our, it's our uh, top statistical health facility. So this is the chance of dying prematurely if you're uh, food insecure. So if you're marginally food insecure, you're 28% more likely to die uh, prematurely, moderate, 49% more likely and 22.6 times more likely if you're severe, severely food insecure. And uh, what, they, what ISIS did, they were careful to look at uh, food insecurity, insecurity as an independent uh, influencer. So uh, they're quite uh, a well-respected uh, institution and I think we can believe these. Um, food insecurity, uh, and this is um, Statistics Canada, does not seem to be a problem of food skills or shopping behaviors. And it does make me wonder if our first approach, which was education as Deep Roots Food Hub, was maybe misguided. We spent a fair amount of money holding workshops. Um, mind you, this is self-rated cooking ability, but um, it uh, shows that people can do most things if they have enough money. So the conclusion um, of this was that food insecurity represents the household's broader material circumstances and takes into account not only income, but things like how much property do you have? Do you have a house? Uh, and other resources that a household might draw upon, even, you know, friendly neighbors, family, and that sort of thing. So um, perhaps all they need is money, but I think there's probably subpopulations who need to mitigate problems with mobility and mental health. And um, for some of those perhaps free or reduced uh, cost of food delivery uh, would help them both financially and with the mechanics of surviving independently. And we just have to look at our terrific delivery system since COVID struck 
uh, we can get just about anything in the world on our doorstep in a day or two. So uh, why not food? Um, this uh, slide is from um, a website called Drawdown. And um, I put that in here. Uh, the arrows at the left here are mine. These are the top items that Drawdown considers to be contributors to uh, CO2 equivalents in the atmosphere. And uh, so it's either uh, created or reduced. So food waste is up there as, as number one. Um, health and education is number two. Plant-rich diets. Uh, whoops. There we go. Sorry about that. Plant-rich diets are right up there. Refrigerant management. And even tropical forest restoration. I just added that one because agriculture is a big contributor to uh, food, to climate change. And then alternate refrigerants. Well, maybe our root cellar is a, a alternately refrigerated place. It relies on nature for its uh, refrigeration. And uh, this is from uh, Eat Lancet. And I know that uh, Dr. Catherine Swift uh, referred to Eat Lancet. And um, there is an inextricable link between human health and environmental sustainability. So our food system nourishes us, but if it's not the right food system, it can make us unhealthy uh, and also make the planet unhealthy. This is uh, from um, Eat Lancet. And uh, this is one of their first strategies is to seek international and national commitment to shift toward healthy diets. So I'll point out the green bars. And those are the green bars that relate to 2050 planetary health diet and having, having the waste uh, that is involved in producing our food. Um, and Counterpunch, of course, says 2050 is too late even at that. But the green bars uh, show us that, well, pretty much if we're going to have a chance at helping our climate out with our food system, we'll keep our whole grains about the same, production of whole grains. Starchy vegetables, um, well, well, we'll produce a few more but not as many as vegetables. And uh, fruits, more. Uh, dairy, a tiny bit more. Red meat, a lot less. So 100 and, or I guess this is 75% less red meat. No more poultry, poultry, fewer eggs, more fish. I'm not sure if the fish would like that. We're threatening to overfish them uh, as it is, and I don't know. Um, we can get a lot of our, our protein from plant sources, so dried beans, lentils, peas, and soy, and nuts. So nuts seem to be the, the big thing that maybe we're missing out. We can produce lots of nuts in Canada, as well as all of these uh, protein sources from, from food. Uh, I was struck by the article from Counterpunch, and it says agriculture is one of the worst offenders, and changing agricultural practices is a must do for our survival. And the most effective, definitively effective, immediately effective, readily doable action is that everyone in the world can go vegan. <laughs> um, theoretically. Uh, in theory, we can all do that. If we do that, emissions drop immediately. So if nothing else, I think our root cellar supports a vegan lifestyle all through the winter. 
And when I read Counterpunch, I was a little depressed. I thought of this poem that ended with, this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. And how else to describe what, uh, what Counterpunch describes is um, looming at us if we don't get um, busy and do something different. That was from the Hall of Men, uh, T.S. Eliot in 1929. And if you read the whole poem, the light of what's happening to us now, it really stands out. So anyway, if that's, yeah, I don't know whether it's possible to get too dramatic. Uh, climate change is, is an extremely serious prospect. Anyway, thanks to our partners, uh, Ottawa, the Green Belt Community Foundation, and um, Good Food Box. Uh, there are others, uh, Just Food, and so on. Okay, so I think it's now question time. Okay, well, thank you, Barry. I found that thank very interesting. And uh, Art Hunter has indicated that he has a question. Uh oh. <laughs> Barry, I will. <laughs> I was really interested in, in uh, of course, the technical description and and uh, how successfully uh, you've been in recovering energy from the ground to to keep the root cellar warm in those bitter cold days, or particularly evenings. However, you you are uh, confronted with a a um, a power budget issue, as you say, yep. you've had to go and and fire up a generator from time to time yep. and uh, I, I would highly recommend that you keep very accurate notes of how much energy you're using yep. um, because you're going to uh, try and meet your your off-grid requirement and somehow you've got to translate that into uh, additional solar panels. Yes. Um, of course, the, the way uh, uh, I, I would recommend doing it is to connect to the grid because uh, Hydro One keeps all those records for you and, and, uh, and just, just temporarily and, and uh, just automate it all and just plug a heater in and away you go, set the... Yeah. Then, of course, um, the the other issue you have is how big is your your battery storage what what do you really need mm -hmm. and a lot of that depends on the outside temperature and how much sun you're getting yes and and those those are two very difficult things to predict because uh, predicting the weather uh has, has always proven a, a very difficult task yeah. um <clears throat> particularly when you're you're looking locally and and right at your root cellar um, yeah. but that doesn't mean it's it's impossible um, I've been in that mode for for three years now and and I'm now driving at uh, uh, reaching 300 days of, of not paying for electricity wow um, so so there's there's things that that, that can be done um, but there's so many variables um, uh, based on the weather that it, it's, it's really tough. So all I can recommend to you is keep some very accurate records of what's happening to the hours of sun, what the outside temperature is, and, and how much power you're consuming because yeah. you've got nothing else to predict your needs for, for next year. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. And so, anyway, your comments on that. Yeah, well, certainly uh, we run out of power um, from time to time. And particularly in the short days, you know, it's December the 21st and it's minus 25 out and it's cloudy. <laughs> and I know from uh, even talking to you that the, the solar gain is not very much there. So, um, uh, we can't afford uh, a power wall uh, just yet, but that would help us out. We, we could, uh, we can't 
quite afford a full bank of, of uh, solar panels. It's, I think we're, we don't have quite the same problem you do as trying to, which is trying to keep livable temperatures up. We only need to get to, you know, between two and four degrees centigrade and we're happy. So um, uh, I think, so probably what we'll do is to keep adding solar panels and batteries until we find that we're 99% or 95%, well, maybe 99% of the way there. And if we have to fire up the generator, it's uh, inconvenient. H hooking up to Hydro One, is an attractive and seductive alternative, um, but it costs money to hook up, <laughs> and it costs money every time, every uh, every month that you're hooked up. So we are trying to avoid that. The only other energy production tool that um, we had looked at briefly, but ran out of, I think, just mental and time resources uh, at the time uh, was to look at a vertical axis wind turbine. And uh, so I put it out there. In fact, listeners, if you're, if you're interested, um, I would still like to build a vertical axis wind turbine and uh, produce uh, in order to provide some charging when the sun goes down. Um, so that may help us as well. Um, that's my, uh, that's my answer. I think, uh, did that answer your, your, is that a sufficient reply to your comments, Eric? Well, you're, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, you're, you're financially constrained, so you're going to be in, in some, some difficulties and to try and, and zero in on it means that you're probably going to have to drain this out for, or drag this out for another two or three years before you can get a handle on it. You don't have the financial resources now. Yeah. Well, yes, we could. Um, we already have, I mean, we have lots of data. And so we know what things look like, um, particularly at night, uh, comparing the exterior temperature to the interior and uh, the, um, the degree of uh, and the temperature changes there. So um, I'm not sure I've, I haven't really had uh, the inclination, well, not the inclination, I have the inclination, but maybe not the skill to uh, analyze all that data. I am going to suggest that we move on now and uh, Mary Hagen has a question or two. Okay. Hi, um, can you hear me everyone? Yep, I can see you too. Okay, great. I can't see everybody's for some strange reason. But anyway, um, I, I'm finding this um, whole presentation extremely useful and timely. Uh, I live in rural Ottawa South, um, not too far <laughs> from you in West Carleton. Yeah. And uh, presently quite active with sustainable Merrickville Wolford group who have focused uh, since the pandemic started particularly on local foods um, and have been through a summer of that, uh, motivated to um, feed uh, more vulnerable stay at home people. And um, we've made a commitment to grow extra food in our own gardens for other people. So we are now facing the whole question of um, how to store food and the questions come up about a communal um, root cellar. Yeah. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, I as a volunteer taken the lead to, to explore this whole question. So I'm so glad you have this fantastic model out there with all your work. Um, first question, why did your community go for such a large standalone kind of root cellar? Um, 
it must have been part of a bigger plan to what have many people storing food there are you partly in a business with people to do that um, and that leads into the whole operating costs once you've done this um, major construction yeah okay well good point um, I think we had considered size and uh, earlier on in the life of the board I wasn't terribly involved in the decisions about size, but there's probably, um, there's probably a degree of uh, return that you get based on the footprint that you have. Um, I think a very small root, so you can imagine a very small root cellar uh, that is not, you know, dug into a hill. Um, it's almost all edge and our edges are the coolest part of our root cellar. So if you expand your footprint, you're expanding the area of uh, heat transfer from the core of the earth. And um, so I think there's a limit to how small you can go. Um, when it came time to uh, plan this root cellar, there wasn't a whole lot of time. I just went with the size that uh, everybody had thought was the right size. So <laughs> this, uh, and, and uh, I had so much money and had to rely on volunteers. So it is, so in a sense, it is what it is. Um, it's big enough to store, um, I keep ratcheting the number of pounds down, but about 50,000 pounds of food and keep it safe through the winter. And it's not just any food, it's root vegetables and uh, any other uh, produce that likes the temperature of between two and four degrees centigrade. That at that temperature, at least for root vegetables, it's enough to keep the root vegetables alive. Those cells still metabolize, but they metabolize very slowly. So um, they don't go ahead and do the things like sprouting or rotting uh, uh, or getting hyper mature the way uh, they would if they were stored at higher temperatures. Um, the ambient temperature of ground at least at this latitude is about 47 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's about, I think about nine degrees centigrade, that would be too warm for us. And um, so I think um, uh, we need to have more control than, than that. So we went with a highly insulated above ground root cellar, which is much easier to gain access to and uh, keeps the water out. Um, you don't want your place flooding. And um, it, uh, it gives us control over temperature and almost accidentally humidity. Um, the only time we ran into humidity was earlier this season when we were bringing in so much cold, dry air at night to keep the place cool. Um, the number of air change, air exchanges was too high to maintain the uh, high degree of humidity. As soon as things cooled down, we stopped bringing in cold air. Uh, the humidity rose to our ideal level, which was 90 to 95%. But um, uh, yeah, so it is, it is the size it is, and we could accommodate probably all the vegetables that you are producing that could survive at those temperatures through the winter. Okay, so Ted, you yeah. have a question, and then uh, John Lake, you'll follow sure. Ted. Thanks, Barry. I'm delighted you're doing, making a difference. Uh, somehow my ancestors survived living in the prairies several hundred years ago. Uh, and 
I think by and large, they ate anything that walked by plus anything that they could freeze. And they yep. spent an awful lot of their time digging ice yep. in summer so that they could maintain temperatures. And there's something very similar I've experienced in central China where the people and their goods live in caves for a good part of the year yes. in order to make sure the stuff is viable. So my question for you is, how far can this experiment go? I mean, it looks like a good idea, but is it really limited in, in climate? Does it have to be a, a specific level of cold for a certain time of the year? Could we export it to the West Coast? Could we move the same kind of concept south? Or are we pretty well stuck where we are? At the moment, and maybe this is lack of imagination on my part, but I think we are stuck with relatively cold climates. Mm -hmm. um, that's our problem in Canada. During the winter, we need to import a high percentage of our food. So if we have the ability to store it through the winter rather than import it, um, there's almost a one-to-one -one advantage there when it comes to importing. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, and I have, I have thought about storing ice. I think it would be possible. They have done that. Um, I think it started in on the British Isles where they they stored ice and sawdust and they would bring it out in July and August to cool their drinks. I don't think all levels of society can afford that to do great that. great tonic water. Yeah. yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so ice can store um, probably deep in the ground where it never gets cooler, uh, warmer than 47 degrees and um, is extremely well insulated. And then I suppose we could pull it out and populate a much larger version of Ice Cube, uh, start our season earlier or even start it in the summertime sure. and keep it going. I think there are calculations to be made <laughs> about how much, exactly how much ice we would need to do that. Um, but I think by the time we're through this experiment, we would, a, lot we would depends, a lot depends on whether we choose to eat local. I mean, if we're gonna want orange juice every day, we've got to import it. But if we're prepared to drink turnip juice so with a little bit of uh, beet sugar on it to make it palatable, who knows? There we go. Yeah, yeah, I don't think we can afford orange juice and it's not particularly <laughs> good for you either. Yeah. Juices are not recommended uh, to be, juices are not recommended. <laughs> they're mm -hmm. very high in sugar. Yeah. And if you drink them in their pure form, they're as bad as pop. Sure enough. And uh, we, we cannot, we can only process so much fructose mm -hmm. as it turns out. Our livers cannot produce uh, enough enzymes to, to uh, fully metabolize that. So we store it as fat and, uh, it's stored in our arteries and kills us. Thank you very much. So. <laughs> well, I have something to contribute. <laughs> I have something to contribute to this discussion, and it has to do with my continuing research on uh, food storage systems. One of the things that's commercially available are transport trucks that have refrigerated units on them. And if you were to think of installing them in communities in warmer climes, and have a array of solar cells or windmills that are able to provide the energy in order to keep the refrigeration units going, then the experiment that we're using here of an insulated building may have uh, applications who knows where in the warmer climates. And so a lot of the information that I'm looking at right now comes from Cornell University and the University of Wisconsin, uh, the more northerly states where there is a lot of research, and I didn't know this until a couple of weeks ago, there's a lot of ongoing research and publications available on this very topic. Yeah, yeah. so that's, uh, that's a great contribution, Phil. I think that, uh, well, a lot of farmers actually supplement their income by putting large solar arrays on their farm uh, as we speak. And I, there's, 
no particular reason except for money in it. And they're actually not that terribly expensive. We could probably get a grant to do that to uh, really ramp up our ability to produce electricity. Then we'd have 120, we'd be able to hook up um, uh, air conditioning units with cool bots or whatever is necessary to cool the place down. And we could be a year round facility and the model could go further south. Art. Okay, so let's, let's move on to John Lake. He has a question. Oh. Where are you, John? John? No. Lost the duct out. Am I, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my own background is uh, I studied civil engineering, got a degree, but never really practiced. Uh, but having attended, I think, with uh, art and uh, and Sheila Murray, something called the National Defense College course. Uh, the host has asked you to start your video. Okay. I just pressed on the, okay, all right. My, my question has to do with the uh, analysis uh, about food insecurity. Yes. And um, I'm going to take a bit of a Oh, I guess you would call it an undiplomatic uh, approach. Perfect. <laughs> my my, my uh, profession was in foreign affairs, with, uh, but uh, I, I've given up being diplomatic. It's more, it's easier to be more direct. Yes. Uh, part of part of those statistics, I wonder, and I'm just asking you, how much they do with Canada's burdens. And here just... I'm referring to uh, the cultural corruption which we, uh, the southern people, have, I won't say forced upon the Inuit, and I won't say forced upon the other indigenous, but let's just take the Inuit. We know that it costs a fortune to feed people in the north. Yeah. There's the old, the old argument, which is, well, look, they were completely self-sufficient before. And yeah. they were. They were. But having spent a week up north and observing, it is amazing how the Inuit try to copy the people in the south. So, you know, you have, you have everything from the... Uh, uh, what do you call the the skidoos, the all this stuff, lots of lots of mechanical stuff, lots of electronic stuff. So that means demands on on power and so on and so on. Uh, I just okay. Th there's that, and then uh, I really would be on thin ice if I push the other one. That is indigenous in general, mm -hmm. but you know we we have been uh, what's the word underhanded, if you wish, making agreements and then walking, walking out on them and so on. But the fact of the matter is, uh, our poor indigenous uh, people, they, a lot of them live on reserves and it just costs that much more money to, anyway, you can see where I'm going, but let's just take the Inuit itself uh, as a question. And my general, I mean, that is, that is a table you have there, which I think may try to do too much, but that's just because we were not given a real background on the table. But uh, food insecurity is linked with a lot of things there, education being one, and uh, even uh, mental uh, illness, I think, is there as well. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> Anyway, there, there's the general, my, my general impressions. But above all, the feeding the Inuit, uh, we have buggered up their lives, let's put it that way. And now they're trying to copy us and it costs a fortune to do that. So there we are. Okay. There, there, there are my comments. <laughs> 
well, that's socio-political comment that um, <laughs> I am probably not as qualified to talk about, but I, I, I did try to say that I was a little bit skeptical about some of the subpopulations. I don't think it's just money uh, that makes people uh, food insecure. It's, uh, it, it's a mixture of other things. And um, it's just that without understanding why people are food insecure, we can go off on the wrong track and try to educate them when they really don't need education. They just need to have access to healthy food and they're quite, most people apparently are quite capable of cooking it and eating it. Um, I agree that uh, the indigenous people were far healthier before we came along. Um, and so were, the, uh, so were the Inuit, or we think, but then we were too. Uh, if you take us back far enough, uh, you know, 400, 600 years, we were mostly agricultural. In fact, you don't have to go back that far most of us were farmers and we produced our own food um, probably a hundred years ago. So, um, however, I think we've sort of jumped into current reality. I don't think we would like to go back and, you know, abandon uh, our cars and houses and uh, access to computers and electricity uh, to Go back to hunt and fish, which is what we used to do, and, and I don't think. Can I suggest that we move on? I am next. I don't think I'll just finish that. I don't think the Inuit or the Indigenous people are any more likely to want to do that than we are. So we have to find some other way. Okay, okay. Uh, we've got Jean Doherty waiting for her question, and then we'll go to Jan Pugsley. Thank you. Um, thank you for an interesting presentation. I um, was wondering who actually has access to using this um, food storage area. You talked about West Carleton being a food desert, and I wasn't certain whether an individual like, you know, in their own home garden could use it, or is it mainly for the farmers who are going to be sending out food packages, you know, they've sold to people. Like, who actually can get access to the to the uh, facility? At the moment, anybody who wants to. Um, and whether that's true in the future or not remains to be seen. We're currently working through a business plan, which doesn't necessarily mean that uh, Deep Roots Food Hub will make a profit on storage, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we won't either. Um, I think there's there are probably um, lots of reasons why people might want to give us grants uh, because we're supporting a change in agricultural practices that in turn support uh, climate uh, much better than say uh, a meat culture would. So I think we're sort of moving away from being a meat culture and going more towards a plant culture. Right. So, so I'm, I'm given to understand then that this is basically at the moment you were given grants to do this, you're seeing if it's going to go and perhaps a business model might come in where in future other ones might end up being like a cooperative or something along that line or you don't know that? Well, I don't know it for sure, but I can, I can give you my bias. I think that um, small producers uh, have a really hard time making a living just mm -hmm. growing produce right. and almost all of the CS CSAs, the, uh, the people who produce food boxes that have been associated with us have gone out of business. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very laborious way of producing food and it's also food that's produced for um, people who are relatively well off. So the model there requires farmers to produce small quantities and sell for above retail prices. Mm. 
And what I'm the economic model uh, that I'm trying to encourage our MITAX intern from Sprott Business School to create for us is the model that looks at the profit curve from mass production, for example, of carrots. And you know, you might get 13 cents a pound for carrots, uh, the farmer might. Uh, if he produces hundreds of acres for them, uh, of them, that's fine, but they sell for say a dollar fifty a pound retail. So somewhere in between there is, uh, I think, a point on the curve where small producers can produce a lot more and sell it for less and make more profit. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, there's a profit curve that we have not yet created yet. Good, thank you. Okay, okay Jen. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Um, Dr. Bruce, I, I've enjoyed your um, talk very much. Thank you. I heard of root cellars before. I was in Newfoundland and I visited the root cellar capital of the world oh yes it um elliston e-l-l-i-s-t-o-n and these root cellars were used starting in the 1800s and became less in demand in 1950 when electricity came in yeah so uh, when I heard you were going to speak about it, I oh yeah, root cellars. I know about that. Now, I don't live in Ottawa anymore. Okay. I know I know where carp is. Okay, good. Did you get your stuff from the Diefen bunker? Um, <laughs> I actually our first attempt to place a root cellar was in the, um, they have an underground garage. Right. That um, is always dry. It's underground and there is an access door that doesn't require, you know, you to move about uh, 20 tons of metal. Um, so, um, we first we proposed our first root cellar to be built inside there. Unfortunately, the board thought it was a bad idea. <laughs> uh, after initially uh, thinking that it was um, it was worth looking at, uh, but they thought it was a bad idea. So um, not in their mandate. So. Um, does that answer your question about the Diefen bunker? <laughs> yes, yes, I was curious about it. Now yeah. I'm going to see see if I can ask this one. There's certain principles, I would think, with root cellars. Yeah. And I happen to live on the Bruce Peninsula. Okay. So it's a different place now. It's a good name. We're about to change it, as a matter of oh. fact. <laughs> All well, right. um, I better not go there. Anyway, um, so the, there's principles and there's factors that are often transferable from one initiative to another. Okay. My question for you is, what are the factors that you believe might be transferable to another part of Canada. Ah, so, so what might make our model transferable to another part of Canada? Yeah, what, not no. you know, like they're not all going to be no applicable, no. but some. No. Okay. Um, I think the whole thing may be transferable to other parts of Canada, particularly if you're looking at uh, the generation of more power with solar panels. Um, yep. I think if you're going uh, somewhat north, 
uh, it becomes more and more applicable and then it becomes less because it's harder to grow root vegetables when you get up towards, I don't know, Hudson's Bay and uh, Cochrane and even, you know, between Cochrane and Hudson's Bay there. Um, going southwestern Ontario, I think they get cold enough nights, uh, it could apply there. Um, the west coast, don't know. So are you prepared to wrap up the issues and offer it to other locations? Well, I think we're looking at, so uh, I'm interested in what does it mean to the big picture? And certainly in developing our business plan, we've asked our uh, intern and, and ourselves to orient our plans to the possibility that we would want to scale up massively. So, you know, what if there were a thousand of these root cellars uh, in Eastern Ontario, for example? And uh, so, um, and anyone else who has a, an idea about this is welcome to chime in because we haven't finished our discussions on that. But I could imagine that uh, local producers, even people producing on their lawns. You know, Phil has said that uh, we should be growing more produce on our lawns, or more more produce and less lawns, something like that. And um, if individuals could produce uh, produce on small properties, then we would have a place to store it. So. But we would need a lot more than just our tiny root cellar. It's amazing how much food people consume. You know, we, we, we consume a ton, literally, of food a year. We waste half of it, mind you, so we got to correct that. But if we're storing, say, 25 tons of food in our little root cellar, that's enough for the current wastage uh, requirements, about 25 people. Um, we need to scale up hugely to make a, a big difference. If, if I could uh, just comment, <coughs> um, clearly you're you're very cash constrained, and that yeah. means you you do not have the full design arm uh, that would be necessary to make this root cellar applicable to just about any place in the globe. But from an engineering point of view, that is absolutely possible uh, it's just a matter of having having uh, uh, enough enough money that goes into the design side at the front end you yeah. can move this just about anywhere yeah i'll make a comment here too if i may when uh, we started looking at the future one of the questions was or one of the suggestions was put to us that what you are doing is patentable i.e. you could make money if you were to distribute the designs that you are using and also to provide the corrective measures for the goofs that you have made. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've decided that, uh, as far as I know, we've decided that we are not going to try to patent whatever it is that we're doing. It's going to be freely available to whomever and we'd be happy to answer questions about the local differences. Yeah. Yep, I've pretty much given up on patenting things since talking to my cousin who uh, was involved in, I guess, sulfur chemistry and trying to patent things there. It doesn't mean much. Big corporations really want it. They just take it and dare you to sue them. So I think you mentioned it, Phil, before that maybe we could have a, a, a bit of income from um, selling plans. And, uh, and actually maybe even having an engineer stamp the plans. Um, that's a possibility. Let's um, move on to Zach's question now. Not really a question. Uh, uh, growing up in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, across the harbor from Halifax, uh, in the 40s and 50s, there was a uh, brisk business in ice. Uh, yep. you could, carve it out of the out of Lake Bannock 
in the uh, summertime, or in the wintertime rather, stored in a very large uh, uh, shed under sawdust in, yep. in, uh, on, the, on the margin of the lake and, and uh, carry it around by horse and cart in blocks for people, yep. ice boxes, remember them? The I have one. Ice box. And uh, that's before uh, there were, you know, a whole lot of refrigerators. Um, I don't know if it would actually be feasible now, though. Uh, for one thing, I think it's warmed up a little bit, but also uh, uh, I very much doubt if if uh, the geography to do that, the the, uh, the footprint's available. Yeah, I I have thought about that. We can dig a hole and insulate it, and fill it with sawdust and freeze, use surface freezing for bottles. Remember, uh, I talked about using antifreeze bottles, so 3.78 liters, must be millions of them used in Canada every year. So 265 of those comprises a metric ton of water. And um, so those could be frozen. I think we we underestimate the power of ice to keep things cold. It's um, you know the the heat of fusion of ice is seventy nine point nine joules, and so it's about eighty times the amount of negative energy stored in that compared to cold water. So. Um, I think there's, I think there is potential in using nature and Canada seems to have lots of cold, at least at the moment. And if we're determined to, to stop climate change, we'll, uh, we'll hang on to that. Okay, well, there are no more questions. Anybody want to uh, raise their hand and have a last word? Okay, Phil, I suggest that you thank our speaker. Okay. Well, thanks, Barry. I hope that uh, everybody enjoyed the, the presentation, got a sense of the challenges that you and the rest of the organization have, have faced. And uh, we'll just keep marching on, won't we? We will. And thank you all for attending. And it's been a pleasure to talk to you and try to answer some of your questions. <laughs>